I really looked last week at Colossians chapter 1, um, at the supremacy of Jesus, that, that Jesus is supreme in all, that he is our all in all, um, and he is the only one that we are to worship. And this is vital in, in our relationship with the Lord. And I'm going to be staying in the book of Colossians for a little while. Um, in the New Testament, we have the four Gospels, and then we have Acts, and Romans, and Corinthians, and then we have the General Electric Power Company. Ah, oh, thank you, Nikki. Nikki's scared I'm not going to make it to St. John's on time. Um, like to welcome... Uh, <laughs> I like that. Um, so it's the 12th book of the New Testament. Please make sure you've got your scriptures with you uh, for the next couple of weeks and uh, so we can do this together because it's so necessary. There are two sweeping themes running through the book of Colossians. The one is Jesus only isn't only just one more thing to be worshipped and adored. Jesus is the only thing to be worshipped and adored. And it's in this book of Colossians that, that I see the supremacy of Jesus. Because Jesus is the greatest and there is none other that we are to worship. If I look at the context of the book of Colossians, Paul had never been there, but, uh, but Ephroditus had been there and, and he had started the church there with Santishi. And he had come back to Rome where Paul is at this point in time. Paul is in prison, he's in house arrest. And he writes this letter back to the people of Colossae. It's a young church, only about six years old. They were so accustomed to the Roman and the Greek cultures, which were the cultures of the day, um, that false teaching starts creeping into the church. The Romans and the Greeks had so many uh, gods that they worshipped. You know, it was almost like the more the merrier. Um, almost like we do with Facebook and Instagram today. We go and check how many followers are there. And this is where the word poly come, polytheism comes from. Poly meaning many, theism, theos, God, many gods. And we do exactly the same today. We worship God and money, or God and success, or God and fame, or God and popularity, or God and people, or God and celebrities. And I can go on and on and on, and today we probably worship God in the spring box. <laughs> Jeffrey told me that last week, uh, after the New Zealanders got a bit of a hiding by uh, the Argentinian team, the whole of Christchurch was in mourning. <laughs> you didn't dare smile. You see, it's God and... But there's only one, only one who we need to be worshipping. And that is Jesus. Jesus is not just one more thing to be worshipped and treasured. He is the only thing that is to be worshipped and treasured. And the other sweeping theme that goes through this book of Colossians is that when Jesus comes into my life, I'm transformed. Now, now, please, you can be offended by what I'm going to say next, and I don't mind if you are offended. It's good if you're offended in church, because it means you're listening and you're going to think about what I'm saying. Um, but if there hasn't been a distinct change in your life since meeting Jesus, then have you met him? I spoke about this when I did The Unsaved Christian and I spoke out of Matthew 7. Yeah. Wide is the way and many go through, narrow is the way. And few walk through that. Because when Jesus comes into your life, there's a distinct change. There's a, there's a change in your home. There's a change in your workplace. There's a change in the church. There's a change in the way you go shopping. I carry 
characters change, our behavior changes, our relationships change. When it's no longer me, I and myself, but I put you before me. I put Jesus before everyone. When Christ comes into our hearts, he changes everything. Why? Because he is there in us. All of God is in Christ, and all of Christ is in us, and Jesus is sufficient. The title of my sermon this morning is uh, Enough, because you see, it is Jesus plus nothing. Nothing. I add nothing. To Jesus. Do you know what four things were sneaking into the church in Colossae and four things I dare say sneak into our churches today and I pick up my reading from 2 Colossians, Colossians chapter 2 from verse 16 where Paul writes to them and says therefore let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one defraud you um, of your reward, taking delight in false humility in the worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up and fleshly in his mind. Paul starts this passage with, with this one little word, therefore. Now every time you see the word therefore in the scriptures, you must ask yourself, what is the therefore, therefore? <laughs> it is there because it means something came before. If I go back and look what came before, then perhaps I must look at, at chapter 2, verse 8, or verse 9, or verse 13, or verse 15. Where Paul, Paul says to them in verse 8, Beware anyone should cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men. And this is the first point, thank you, Heath. That so often we tend to put legalism, and that's the buzzword in the church today, legalism ahead of Christ. We make the rule. How often haven't you heard people say, if you're a Christian then, you're supposed to be doing X, Y, and Z. Paul says, no, don't do that. What God requires of me is not legalism. It's obedience. When I read through the Old Testament, when I read through the sayings of Jesus, when I read the red letter, um, version of, of the Bible, then I realize what Jesus is asking me for is obedience, not legalism. God doesn't demand. God wants us to, to, to obey. But you know what we do? We say, we'll take Jesus and then we'll add the rules. You may not eat this, you may eat this. You may not do this. You have to go to this festival and you have to do this feast day. You've got to spend Easter like this. You've got to celebrate Christmas Day. Whose rules are those? They're not God's rules. God never made the rules. We make the rules. And if we make rules, then we make them for ourselves. I'm a teetotaler. I drink Coke Zero. I don't drink tea. I'm a coffee toter. Mm -hmm. Don't like tea. It's my belief. I didn't stop drinking alcohol because of my belief in God. There was a totally different reason for me to stop. I've never yet spoken about alcohol from this book. Never. It's the same as I don't speak about money. My it pertains to my life. And the moment I start imposing my rules for my life on you, I'm imposing legalism. 
And unfortunately, that is what happens to us today. The Bible does give us principles to, to, um, to live by, and we call them closed hand and open hand principles. God tells us to worship Him. Huh? Closed hand principle. He doesn't say we must sing as the deer in C at a tempo of. He doesn't do that. That's our choice. That's our choice. God tells us that we have to educate our children. <coughs> Closed hand principle. But he doesn't tell us which school to go to, whether to go to a public school or a private school or this school or that school or a home school or whatever. God doesn't say that. Open hand principle. I have the right to choose. And God gives me that choice. You see, there's a major difference between the principle, worship me, and the method. And sometimes we make the method the more important. We need to be clear on this. God has God principles that we need to obey. But we need to leave everybody to be free to choose their own. The next thing that creeps in, thank you Heath, is mysticism. Verse 18 says, let no one defraud you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding on things that he has not seen. And we start holding on to visions and dreams and angels and all the supernatural things. And we think that if we hang on to these things, we're going to get closer to God. And we end up chasing experiences instead of chasing after God. We want that goosebump experience. We want the goosebump experience. And if we don't get it, oh, you know, it wasn't such a good service today, eh? How many of you got goosebumps just now when we were singing? Or was it just me? You see, the moment we focus on Jesus, the goosebumps come. The moment Jesus is the most important to us, the experiences come. We have experiences in my home on a Friday evening, every Friday evening. We have goosebumps every Friday evening. Can I tell you the vision I had on Friday evening? We were singing a song, Virah Here, and I'm going to try. Didn't sing it today. We're singing it next week, I think, I hope. Virah Here. Vies and Beer. We say, yeah? Vies and Beer. And you know what? When I closed my eyes, I saw us sitting in the tent with all of us with our hands up. What an experience. What an experience. But the experiences come when Jesus is first and not last. Sometimes we want bigger and better and bolder. We <clears throat> come to church to to have this experience, to have the goosebumps. Can I ask you a question? Will you still love Jesus if you don't have the experience? Or is it just the experience that you want? Jesus doesn't tell us to chase emotionalism. He tells us to follow him in everything that he does. If your experiences stop, will you still follow Jesus? I don't know about you, but I know that when Fricky and I met and we fell in love, uh, you know the butterflies in your tummy and your hands that are sweaty and your mouth that is dry? You know that? Uh, after 48 years of marriage, which we celebrated on Wednesday, nearly the 50, nearly the big one. Right. Are the butterflies still there? Are the butterflies still there? Does that mean I don't love him anymore? He's passing comments here about that. <laughs> Are the butterflies still there? He's saying yes. He's saying yes. Oh. Ah, you just want to lunch today. <laughs> Does that mean I love him any less? No. 
No. Does it mean I love you more? Well, yes. And that's how it goes. And the same happens with Jesus. When, when I don't have a vision, when I don't have a tongue, when I don't see something, when I don't see the angels, which Naboya saw in our house the other day, what a blessing when the angels come and worship with us, eh? There we go. But it happens when Jesus is the focus. The other thing that, that um, crept in is the aestheticism. Where it's Jesus plus loss. You know how many Christians adhere to poverty theology today? Where, where there's a spiritual attraction to having less. No. They were teaching the people of Colossae that the less you got, the holier you got, the less you eat, the less you drink, the less you own. That's poverty theology. Where does Jesus come into it? Where does Christology come into it? The opposite side of poverty theology is prosperity theology. <clears throat> you know, if you give a hundred rand, God will multiply it to two hundred rand. No. You cannot get closer to Jesus through things, through money, through poverty, or through prosperity. Do you love God less if you sleep in a nice bed or live in a decent home or have a dependable car? Poverty theology, and this is what they were teaching the people of Colossae, if you don't have those things, you're going to be closer to God. No. A couple of years ago, there was a monk who lived in, in Egypt, but he was born in Greece, uh, Monk Antony, who prided himself on the fact that he'd never washed his feet for 102 years. <laughs> that doesn't make you more holy, that just makes you stinky. <laughs> when I have less, it doesn't mean that God loves me more. When I have more, it doesn't mean that God loves me more than my more. God loves me. If I, if I just go one page back, you know, I remember I said to you, General Electric Power Company to the book of Philippians, and Philippians chapter 4, it's just one page back, uh, if you go back. Um, and from verse 12 where it says, is it Philippians 4, Philippians, Philippians 3. <laughs> I'm sure it's 4. There, at this point. Where Paul writes and says, I know how to be abased, how to be whipped, how to be spat upon, how to be abused. I know how to be abound, tied up in chains. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full, prosperity theology, and hungry, poverty theology, both to abound prosperity theology, and to suffer poverty theology. And then he says that incredible verse in 13, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not about other things. It's not about stuff. It's about Jesus. All about Jesus. There are these four things that, that, and Paul says it to the people in, of Colossae here, that we tend to live in the shadows instead of living in the sunlight of Christ. Christ came to this earth as a baby. He walked this earth. He went to the cross. He died, he was buried, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and he makes intercession for me. Why? Because he loves me. What's in the last slide, please? True salvation is Jesus plus nothing. Jesus plus nothing. Nothing. 
None of the prosperity theology. None of the mysticism. None of the aestheticism. And definitely not any of the polytheism or the legalism. Looks as I'm stuck in the isms today. You see, Jesus is our all in all. And when we follow him with everything that we are, then everything else comes with. Everything else comes with. The visions, the goosebumps, the angels, the everything. Verse 19 says, Hold fast to the head from whom all the body is nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments and grows with the increase which is from God. Not from God. And so people, the day I start preaching Jesus and Jesus crucified, died, buried, risen and ascended into heaven is the day I need to start preaching. Let's stand together as we pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that it's Jesus plus nothing. Thank you, Jesus, that you are all sufficient, that you are my all in all. And it's in you that I need nothing more. Oh, Father, help me as I go through this day just to keep my eyes focused on you and on who you are. Help me, Father, to find everything I need in you. In Jesus' name. Amen.